Burgers. Is there anything more American than burgers? I can't think of it. Oh, I guess there's one thing. Advertising. Advertising has become such a mainstay of modern life that the type of advertising we're exposed to has just gotten weirder and weirder in an attempt to grab our attention. And video games are not immune from its influence. Most modern in-game advertising is similar to how ads appear in the real world. Think advertising hoardings in sports games, promotional appearances in Fortnite, or Obama election posters in Burnout Paradise. However, in the 90s, the lines between brands and advertising were blurry. Cool Spot, Chester Cheetah, and The Noid were all branded characters who had their own games. Zool appeared to take place in a world dedicated to Chubba Chups, or Chupa Chups if you're American. I don't know which one's right, they both sound stupid. Both James Bond 2 and Pushover crammed advertising into their intro videos so that the entire motivation for the games were based around saving brands. For James Bond 2 it was the same penguin chocolate bars my mummy would pack into my school lunchbox every day, and for Pushover it was Quavers, a British crisp brand represented by a dog called Colin who wore an all-yellow mobster suit. You know, normal 90s shit. Hey, remember Darkened Sky? Probably not. It was a real 5 out of 10 PC and GameCube fantasy platformer that had absolutely no advertising in it whatsoever, except for the magic system, which was based entirely on Skittles. And finally, the innermost circle of advertising hell, the Adver game. Games produced for the sole purpose of advertising their brands. There's no subtext here, no talking around it. This is an advertisement that you play, and we're gonna put the name of the brand on the box. Be it Chex Quest, Pepsi Man, Doritos Crash Course, or even America's Army. But there's one particular set of games that lives in infamy, a collection of advert games that still occupy a space in the public zeitgeist. I am, of course, talking about the Burger King games. The Burger King games Sneak King, Pocket Bike Racer and Big Bumpin' were released 17 years ago in November of 2006, and today we're going to explore their design and development like never before. We're going to explore the business behind the deal, the demands that Burger King and Microsoft had on the project, the design of the three games and how one of them was secretly developed by a studio responsible for one of the most violent games ever, how and why these discs are the only dual format games ever made and we're going to talk about Glover, Reservoir Dogs, Bad Boys, Giant Heads, Fandom and Legacy. We're going to talk to the man who's collected 4,000 copies of Sneak King. And we're going to try and clear up the whole Steve Bannon aspect of this story. Apologies in advance, this one gets weird. My journey to this very moment started on Twitter when Neil in Atlanta, Georgia made this great suggestion. A good idea, I thought. Time for some desktop research. I looked up the studio that worked on it and was surprised to see it was based in England, as these games were only ever released in North America. And after a bit more digging, I realized that the studio was founded by the Oliver Twins. Now, the name the Oliver Twins may mean absolutely nothing to you, but these guys were an institution in the British game dev scene in the 1980s. They're probably best known for the Dizzy series of games and bunches of simulators released in the early days of Codemasters. But they were arguably the most successful 8-bit developers of a generation. Over half of the 50 games they developed were UK number one bestsellers. They accumulated over 5 million sales during this era, and at one point, these two young men represented around 15% of all UK game sales. By the mid-2000s, the twins were in their late 30s and had formed their new studio, Interactive Studios. The studio's first game, Glover, had been a success, but as they took on more and more work, they had to grow, and the types of games they worked on diversified dramatically. So, first things first, let's call up some British video game royalty. So we just had um, all of the 80s success with Codemasters, making our own games, just me and Andrew in a bedroom, and we knew that the computers were getting more and more complicated, that we had to have staff, um, we had to have artists, we had to have audio guys, because we couldn't do everything. So Interactive Studios was the branding to go out and find other clients. It's like, we're not just a Dizzy guys, look, we've got all this other kind of stuff. We built the company from 94, in 94 it was 12 people, and up to 99 it was oh, uh, about 100 people. Glover and Frogger and, and a bunch of the others. So I'd been there, I joined in 90, 
nine, I think. It's the usual kind of, at that point, the games industry is full of like um, passion and enthusiasm. You just wanted to be a game maker. You didn't care about the money. You didn't care about the hours or the crunch or anything like that. You just wanted to make games. So Philip and Andrew realized quite early on that you needed a bit of a spread bet portfolio because games would just go pop beyond your control. You could have suddenly an IP get dropped on you and then, and then that game's canned. So you needed something to kind of cope with the troughs of, of game development, basically, and, and things outside your control. So I think by that point, we were probably on about three or four games running concurrently. Most of it's fun. I mean, I'm proud of all the games we did. I mean, whatever they were, I'm proud of them. Whether or not the finances behind them were much fun. In fact, in fact, on the shelf, if we look at the finances of 99% of them, there was no fun. It's like... We got screwed over on most things. Interactive studios, like many studios during this time, split their efforts between in-house projects they created themselves and gun-for-hire contract work that kept the bills paid. And much of that work was for games on existing intellectual properties, things like cartoons, toys, and movies. Over the years, they were responsible for games based on Action Man and Barbie, The Little Mermaid, Chicken Run, and everyone's favorite cartoon, Bad Boys 2. But even contract work based on big Hollywood properties was still fraught with risk. One of the games I worked on was um, Titan AE, which was the big, the big Don Bluth film. And we just went through a horrible alpha submission, finishing at like four in the morning. As the film had come out, done really badly, the whole of Don Bluth's studio, 400 animators got, got axed and we got cancelled that morning, basically. <laughs> just got the notification that that's it, we're not bothering this game anymore. So yeah, so you need that kind of built-in redundancy, really, of having more than one project to, to keep a company going. Well, you did at the work for hire days anyway, like that. From the um, signing of the sort of first um, couple of PlayStation games, um, the budgets went up, um, the profitability kind of, of the business went up, and, and actually, as we got to 99, we said, you know what, Interactive Studios is a really dumb name. So we renamed the company at that point to Blitz Games. Is that a fucking setup or what? <laughs> fucking right. Shit. Orange got tagged. Good shot. Man, this is fucked up. This is so fucked up. So we were approached by um, a company called SCI, I believe. Uh, would we like to pitch um, on doing the game for Reservoir Dogs? Reservoir Dogs, how cool is... Wait a minute, how do you do a game of like, three guys pointing guns at each other in a warehouse? Our concept was that basically what they were describing in that warehouse of how they fucked up the heist, you're going to actually play that game of that heist and how they fucked it up. And it was at the time of Grand Theft Auto 3, so everybody's imag imagining it's got to look a bit like Grand Theft Auto 3, especially the setting and everything else. Obviously, they had a, a budget of like 50 million plus and we had a budget of like 1 million or something, um, which doesn't kind of marry up too well because people's expectations are, why doesn't it look as good as Grand Theft Auto? Anyway, when it came to the marketing back in those days, one big launch, one big drop date, everything go. And on the day of release, an email, a fax went out to every retailer, take it off the shelves. You saw it here. Ah! It is mature. And it says mature on the box. And it says mature on the front. But, oh, I've got one of the proper ones. It's got mature on the disc. However, the first batch, they'd missed the M on the disc. Printing error, printing error. They forgot to put the M on the disc. Um, and so the whole lot had to be withdrawn. Everybody had to send them all back. You're not allowed to sell it because the disc could come separated from the box and then little Johnny goes, I found a disc and I'm gonna put it in. Oh no! No! At about that time in 99, we were one of the biggest independent um, game developers around. So we got approached by Microsoft. <laughs> Almost secret meetings of like, we might be making something and we might be wanting to contract you to do something. And um, we want something in the kind of party genre. Um, what can you do for us? So we came up with Fusion Frenzy. Um, we didn't call it Fusion Frenzy, it was actually called Blitz Party. 
it was the very, very first game um, on on the Xbox. Bill Gates says it's his favourite Xbox game and all this kind of stuff. And Fusion Frenzy actually hit the shelves a week before the Xbox hit the shelves. It was actually in the shops without the Xbox. Despite their success with Fusion Frenzy, Blitz made no money on the project, having spent the entire budget during development. So when it came to negotiate terms for a sequel, and they asked for a bigger check, they couldn't see eye to eye with Xbox. Microsoft would go on to hire a different studio to make Fusion Frenzy 2. But months later, they'd reach out to Blitz about another project that had come their way. And, that, and, that's, and that's how we were first contacted. It's like, look, we saw what you did with Fusion Frenzy. We like what you did with Fusion Frenzy. Fusion Frenzy 2's gone a different direction now to a different developer. But another opportunity's come in. It's like, how would you guys like to do a few games, quite small, as a promotion piece with Burger King? And we go, let's, let's hear what the gig is. And they said, well, they want to drive people in multiple weeks in. And as you, you're aware, normally the fast food stores give out the little dolls to do with kind of the latest Disney movie or whatever. And they said, but we want to basically drive them into the stores to sort of get Xbox games, and we can produce the discs very, very cheaply because we make them ourselves, and these discs are quite, quite cheap. So we can put them in. So that's the slot we've got, and we've booked in for this period. Are you up for doing three games? Um, so we said yes. We had the dev team who'd just been let down by somebody else, by, by their other division. Uh, <laughs> so we sort of basically moved those people across and put those people onto it. There was one one big kickoff meeting so um uh, it was in new york it had quite a few people it had three or four people from microsoft it had three or four people from our side i can't quite remember there were two different agencies and there was a burger king representative and at this point we'd kind of already agreed that it was probably going to be us it was very very interesting the um the burger king and the uh, representative in the agency did a very good presentation on what the brand of burger king was about and the whole kind of offbeat quirky somewhat subversive kind of culture that they were trying to establish with it the complete opposite of ronald mcdonald basically at that point of like this creepy somewhat sinister king character yeah so we had a good kind of brainstorm there about the kind of games they wanted something a little bit quirky but also not particularly risky on the kind of gameplay point of view it was absolutely agreed that the games could not slip and had to be done within like i think it was 10 months from being in that meeting room but also dual format was then kind of etched in stone as that's the thing we want to do. I think we did a good job of reining in scope because obviously with that little time, two formats, 10 months and three games, we um we did manage to bring them back down into like, you just want slices of fun. You don't want to try and have like Pocket Bike Racer with 15 levels, three or five is fine. We can keep that more contained and just, just have sort of better slices of experience. And, and that's all you kind of want from like a 399 game. You're not expecting 40 hours of gameplay really. Jolyon Webb was the art manager without him on the other side i think i was probably much more focused really on just getting the games but he did a, a brilliant job and again he's also very very experienced so he knew and he had confidence to kind of deliver works in progress and how to talk that through with them both xbox and the agency handling burger king were hands-on from start to finish microsoft assigned a dedicated producer to the project while the agency had two of theirs working full time on it they had conference calls often initially twice a week and then eventually daily somewhat by accident due to the fusion frenzy sequel being taken off their plate the team at blitz working on these games was comprised of some of their most experienced developers this was key to getting the work done Done right first time around. To get this project out the door on time, they split the development pipeline in half. Gameplay and tech for the three games was established without graphics, while the graphics pipeline went through an immediate approval process all on its own. In this way, they could get three games worth of art assets signed off by Burger King without holding up development, and then they could implement these graphics before the games went out the door. Right from the start, we said, look, what we're going to do is we're going to make the game's all kind of like blocked out meshes, no real graphics, and you're going to trust us that these games are going to be okay. And separately, we're going to have the art approval pipeline because there's so many stakeholders here that really care about all of this. You're going to want to spend a lot of time getting the King character right and his look and feel and all the graphics. So we went down that path with, with all three games and that was, yeah, that, that worked fantastically. If they hadn't have gone with that, I don't think the games would have come out because we needed to just focus on getting the games done getting the graphics slowly approved and then just mash it together with like not much time left at all in the, in the schedule.
Getting three games out the door was an insane task given the timeline, and even if these three games weren't full-length games, they still required bespoke art, tech and gameplay, and they had to be fun. But Blitz had another trick up their sleeve. You see, one of the games was not entirely made by Blitz, they actually ghost outsourced it to a different studio in the UK, a studio responsible for making one of the most infamous and violent driving games of the 90s a studio that the folks at Blitz were eager to finally be able to give credit to. Po Pocket Bike was a, a bit of a different path. We already knew we were going to make like basically a Mario Kart style game. It was going to be an arcadey racer game, a few levels, power slides, that kind of thing, nothing too sim simulation based. Um, we had started thinking about using our own engine Blitz Tech, but also just with the kind of the UK networking, Andrew Oliver was good friends with Patrick Buckland from Stainless Games down at the Isle of Wight. So we actually ended up using them to ghostwrite and ghost develop the, uh, the pocket bike race again for us. So I actually had quite a few trips with my technical manager or art manager down to the Isle of Wight to, to meet Patrick and his crazy team as they uh, they basically had it. So it's a, it a kind of like an evolution of the Carmageddon engine that they were using. Um, it was a little bit too uh, perfect for us. We had to do a bit of work with their physics guy to kind of remove some of the simulation bit and put more of like a power slide aspect in there. I think they'd orchestrated like a, a gossip thing about whether Brooke Burke was in a relationship with the King and they'd done like a paparazzi style photo somewhere where the King and her were spotted together. So so that was already one of the lists of characters that we should be adding to it. So yes, we had Brooke Burke in there as well. Obviously the King had to be there, Brooke Burke had to be there, the Chicken had to be there. But then I think we were given a bit of choice. Uh, there was also a level called Bacon Cheddar Ranch, which takes place on a ranch. Was that something? Do you remember anything about that? <laughs> Vaguely. <laughs> that came from uh, another surreal twisted advert that they'd done in the States. Okay. I can't remember the details of it, but yeah, we basically, that, that style came just from the advert there. It's in a weird way, you actually had like a lot of like lore to pull from. Like, yeah. You wouldn't have thought, but I guess presumably that helped quite a lot that they had sort of established a lot of these characters and worlds you didn't so you didn't have to ideate too much because i imagine that's where some of the friction could have come yeah absolutely you know they they had as you say so much kind of background for for us to use and then we um once once we had these kind of great presentations so we got it and we understood what we were doing and the kind of more counterculture kind of approach then yes it got a lot easier to kind of create the assets and and the kind of gameplay that they were looking for There was a sumo game in Fusion Frenzy with the rollerball cage type things. So I think it started with life round on that. And But then they wanted the characters in there and quite visible. So then it was dodgems. So then I think, yes, we kind of fell into the, ah, right, we've got two games with kind of essentially racing, but very different styles of gameplay. Oh, funny. So it ended up being dodgems because dodgems don't have a roof. I think that was the reason why we ended up with Dodgems, yeah. Yeah, we made that the same way as Fusion Frenzy, like a, a one-page design that you could just do variants of quite easily and, and polish it. So it's it's probably the most graphically sort of resplendent one. It, we had a lot more time there to do things with the shaders and try and do some 360 specific bits as well as like make it work on the Xbox One. Well, Xbox One, the original Xbox. And again, it was another one of like, uh, just trust us, we've done this kind of game before. So that they could trust us that we were going to do a game and then give them the kind of the again, that slice of quality that they needed and that they were looking for. So yeah, we didn't have the right much at all to, to kind of get sign off. Pocket Bike Racer and Big Bumpin' had their fans, but if the Burger King project is a boy band, then the next game was the act that successfully went solo, the Justin Timberlake or George Michael of the bunch, a game with a premise so bizarre that even today it defies genre. But before we dive into the design of this oddball cult hero, I want you to meet somebody, a man who has taken his love for this game to levels that most of us would never even thought of, let alone achieve. Hey, how's it going? My name is Leary Patterson. I'm a reality show idiot, and I am the senior video editor for Gippy, and I love fast food games like, you know, Pepsi Man, it's great. The McDonald's Happy Pack, it's awesome. Pocket Bike Racer is a good one, but this is not the Burger King game we are here for. Let me show you what you're looking for. Welcome to the Sneak Pit. So 
So back in 2006, Burger King released three games. About one of each, it was great, and that was the end of the story. Until 2016. I found 50 copies at a dollar store, and I thought this would be the funniest gift to give to people. A 10-year-old game about the Sneak King, love it. Burger King, love it. It's great. It's got the perfect, terrible gift written all over it. So I bought 50 of them, put them on my shelf for a few months later for Christmas, and I realized I really like the way they look on my shelf. I think I'm going to keep them and I'm going to keep collecting them. So you'd find them for a dollar at GameStop, you'd find them from a dollar everywhere else. And, and so over a few years, I had 200 copies. Once COVID hit, I, I was dying to like go out and make YouTube content. I lived off of people collecting video games and going to, you know, yard sales or going to whatever. And I was like, I want to do that, but I want to only find game. I only want to find Sneak King. That's it. That's funny to me. It's a funny niche. Let's do it. Um, and during the second episode, we bought a thousand copies and it just kept getting worse from there. <laughs> so now we've got over 4,000 copies and a bunch of rare stuff I'll show you today. And it's been a wild journey. And as long as it remains funny, it's gonna keep going. So the Burger King games, there's three of them that were released. There's Big Bumpin', Pocket Bike Racer, and the best one of the bunch, Sneak King. You would buy a value meal, and then for an extra, like, I think it was 10 bucks, you'd get a copy of the game, whichever one you wanted. And then, so what they did was they sold them for, for about six months, I believe, and then it was gone. And they ended up in uh, bins all over the world, in, in uh, different warehouses, different whatever, and people would buy thousands of copies hoping to flip them, and they would just sit in their garage for years. And uh, so that's where I come in. Buying them in bulk from private collectors who they think they're getting a deal, they're buying them probably for 200 bucks for a thousand games, and they think they're gonna make all this money, and no one wants this game except for me. Nobody. So if you have a copy at home, hold it tight. Because one day I will come knocking on your door and I will be leaving with your copy. So through my journeys of collecting sneaking, I've come across some, some rare memorabilia, some rare pieces to add to the Museum of Sneaking. For instance, I got two copies graded. We got a 9.6 and 9.4 by WADA. I could probably sell these for 20 bucks, maybe. You know, depends on the market. The market always changes. So we got those. We've got like packing slips. These were sent in the boxes to uh, all the different Burger Kings around the world. I also have the boxes that they would ship the games in to the store. Everyone, everyone that I buy in bulk has come in a box like this. Saved one just for, you know, for the memories because I'm sentimental. I found this thing on eBay. <laughs> it's a weird, like they, they I, it was probably made by that warehouse in Fresno where they're like, we need to get rid of these somehow. And we also have a bunch of DVD cleaner kits. Let's just pack them all together. So yeah, it's such a weird little collection. And I, I see these like maybe three times a year on eBay. The, the, the piece to end all pieces. I've never seen this in the wild. I've never seen it on eBay, and I look every single day. This is the only one I know of that's currently in existence. There might be more, I'm sure there are. Never seen them, I never heard about this. We bought a box of a, a thousand Sneak Kings. While going through, we're pulling out all the copies of Sneak Kings. There's a couple pocket by Grace, there's a couple big bumping, mostly Sneak King. And then I pulled this out, and it blew my mind. This is the BK Xbox video game collection. This was sent to Burger King stores before the release of the games to hype it up, to let people know like, hey, so there's fake screenshots on the back there. Oh, man. That's not what the games look like at all. Those are just, you know, concept shots. And then on the inside, it's not even a game. There's no like demo, to, it's, it's a promotional DVD that just kind of shows off, hey, here's what, here's what it is. And it, the instruction manual goes over the highlights of each game how the sales figures are supposed to be and how it's supposed to amp up sales oh, and why wow. they should do it. It's got a letter to the franchisees saying like, hey, this is a good deal, we should do this. And then the order form so that you can order however many copies you want for your store. Like I said, I've never seen this in the wild. I, I don't know if there's how many copies are out there. Not a clue. I'll show you my favorite copy. It's this one right here. So my wife thinks this is dumb as hell. Luckily, she's always supported my really dumb things. She's at least never gotten in the way and, and never, uh, she hates that it takes up so much space in the garage and I completely understand and, and, and respect that. On the flip side though, she was the first one to find a thousand of them for sale uh, on Craigslist or, or Facebook Marketplace. So she may not like it, but she supports it. 
and that makes for a great wife. I won't take full credit for that. In fact, I'll take zero credit for that. This was an advertising agency concept. And they said, well, the king is the most important character and therefore people want to control him. And we were like, yeah, okay, see your logic. But then what, what, what's the objective? And I mean, this is kind of in the wake of Grand Theft Auto as well. I mean, Grand Theft Auto 3 being the biggest thing at the time. We kind of felt that we understood why they wanted to control the king. We understand that they wanted screenshots that looked a little bit Grand Theft Auto-ish. It was, it's also supposed to be silly. And, it, and these games were, were kind of free or very, very cheap. So does it matter the game's not that deep? Does it matter that it's a bit silly? From memory, I think they did want something that was a bit more about embodying the king. And we were trying to work out what that would be, whether it's like a pac man type thing or, or something like that. Um, so we came up, it was definitely the riskiest game of the three by, by far. We came up with essentially the Metal Gear Solid style sneak em up. The trouble we found with that really was um, separating the art style from the gameplay. It, it just was not fun when there was no art in there. Just, just yeah, just running around as like in, a, in an empty graphic world up to something and then just doing a little golf swing and then ta-da, points felt pretty rubbish. Uh, I'm sure you've kind of found this as many others have in the past that sometimes you can have good gameplay, great, you just put graphics on top and you, you're sorted. Other times you've got not very good gameplay, but when you polish it with graphics and sound, it can come to life and become something. And, and this was like, yeah, what, six, seven months in it's like, it's still not fun. This had better come together when the graphics drop in. And luckily, yeah, we were, once it came there with the king, given his weird flourish to deliver the hamburgers and stuff like that, then we thought, oh, uh, yeah, this is probably going to work. This will be, this ticks the box, and the agents loved it, and uh, Microsoft thought it was great. So, yeah, out it went and became, as you say, the one that people most remember. I suspect because it's probably in a way because it's most on brand for, for BK, it's weird. It's a bit of a surreal, twisted game to kind of stalk someone and then deliver a hamburger in a fancy way to them. It's... It's not your standard kind of gameplay idea. For that one, we had to do motion capture. And so, so we did motion capture and we had to do motion capture of the king. And I think we'd already tried once and um, the agency had looked at it and said, no, that doesn't, that's not right. That's not how the king walks. That's not, that's not how he turns. And then they realized it's the head. You need the king's head. And so, Expensive courier came across with the actual king's head for us to then put the mocap back to, to, to act out. So that arrived in Blitz's office and we opened the box and there's this king's head. And of course, when it turned up and you open up this crate and when it got a massive head well, with like leather straps on it and stuff, of course, people were putting it on and running around the office, just messing around, especially as we're working on Sneak King. So people would kind of go up to you and go, hey! <laughs> So we had a nice time putting that on, filming each other running around the office with the king's head on. Then the uh, then the agency guy arrived and he said, oh, there's a head here. Great. And he picks it up with such loving care and said, there's only, there's only one of these in the world, you know. So, oh, wow. <laughs> you don't want to know what we were doing half an hour ago with that. You haven't tried putting it on, have you? For God's sake, don't wear it. We go, no, no, I haven't worn it. No, no. Do you know how expensive that thing is? For God's sake. But um, yeah, we took that then down to the animation mocap area and... Um, down in Oxford and uh, yeah because because it's so heavy and it goes around there so it's all a kind of had to turn like that and and then all the motion capture kind of worked properly and and it actually looked like the king and they were happy then but yeah we had to have the the head <laughs> sent over so the Steve Bannon thing I spent more time trying to figure this out than I'd like to admit and I'm not sure I've got a great answer. It all stems from a quote in Joshua Green's book, Devil's Bargain, which suggests that the former Trump advisor and convicted criminal either invested in or was on the board of a company involved in the Burger King games deal. From reaching out to people involved in the quote, I haven't been able to find a tangible connection between Bannon and Sneaking. Though Bannon did successfully get Goldman Sachs to invest in a World of Warcraft gold farming sweatshop in China, so really, who knows? In my mind, it's equally as likely that the connection is loose at best, or it's just plain made up. And as twisty as this tale is, we're about to hit another bump in the road. An element of these games' production that we haven't talked about yet, but makes them some of the rarest pieces of optical media in the history of games. 
when you walk into in 2006 when you work into um, the uh, a burger king store and you say xbox what do you actually mean in 2006 you've got the xbox original and then you've got the xbox 360 and so halfway through production they suddenly said hang on a minute most of the people going into store the majority of people are going to have the original xbox but we don't want to promote the original Xbox, when we do our TV campaigns and everything, we only want to show the Xbox 360. You've now got to make it for Xbox original and Xbox 360, and we're not paying you any extra money, and we're not giving you extra, any extra time, and you just have to make it work. But also you have another problem, and this is the problem that most customers don't realize is, that look at the disc. It's a single disc, but you can put it into either Xbox and it just works. So they, they had to do some clever mastering their end because we had to provide them two separate masters and then their end, they had to do some special mastering and then put some technology in the BIOS to basically identify, they can't update the old Xboxes but they could update the new Xbox 360s to recognize, wait a minute, it's one of those Burger King games. I need to read these tracks, not those tracks. I can't remember all the details, but um, my technical manager was um, Eniko, so he had to do a fair bit of this head scratching. Um, one thing to our advantage was we were using our own Blitz Tech engine, which, like many other engines, it could deploy to Xbox, the original, and it could deploy to 360. So we could essentially write once, and the game would work on both, and then we could do some bespoke code to make the 360 version look a bit better with shaders and materials and that kind of thing. So that side was okay. As we started testing a dual boot disc, it turned out, as you say, this had never been done before. And the, the TCRs, the technical checklist requirements for Microsoft didn't actually work. So, so there was a whole bit of a, uh, yeah, a bit of a mad rush at the end where the QA team and Microsoft were having to try and rework what the requirements were because we kept failing certification on things that just could not, it could not pass. The kind of SDK didn't match what needed to be done on the certification compliance side. So it's got a bit messy right at the end there trying to get them to actually, yeah, get it to pass. Yes, these are the only these are the only dual format discs, I believe. Um, I'm not aware of any others. And most people don't even know that they were special dual format. And most people never even thought about it. And back in those days, like a lot of people just said, it's for my Xbox and plugged it in and they didn't even think about it. Um, which actually, from a marketing point of view, is cool. It's exactly what they wanted. It's the, the people didn't worry about it. Um, they let the developers have all that hassle. <laughs> <laughs> Legacy is a funny thing. Creative people often have very little say in what they are remembered for, and often the project you loved dearly and put the most effort into is not that thing. Sometimes it's a Burger King game where the guy sneaks around and does a little dance. Why is it that we remember games like this? Is it because they were good? The best designed games we've ever played? Probably not. Maybe it's just because they made us laugh or because they were so different and unique that we couldn't help but remember them. If there's one thing about these games that stands out from talking to the people behind them is that there was very little luck or happenstance behind them getting made. These were smartly planned and executed games where clear communication between developer and client was established throughout. So now when I look at these games, I don't just see the funny dance or the head or the burger driving a bike. I also see the work of some talented and dedicated developers who were somehow able to design and create three entirely different games that ran natively on two different generations of consoles in under eight months. And regardless of what the games were about, that's certainly something they can be proud of. I'm so proud. <laughs> that these games live on in people's um, psyche and, 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 and out now. I mean, we've done many, many, right, we've done many, many games. And some of them, they come out and they kind of fade away. But some of them, Dizzy is an, ex like, uh, an obvious one, a Glover is another one that keeps coming out. Uh, Fusion Frenzy, people talk about a lot. And of course, when I say the Birkin games, actually, there's only one that's really the really standout one, and that's the one that people have just for, well, as you say, 20, almost 20 years now, people are still talking about this one. And it uh, makes me proud, really, like, uh, and, and amused at the same time, especially when it's so, such a crazy game. 
I think the legacy is very weird, to be honest. Um, yeah, if I quite often if I meet people and they'll and I'll say I've been game, doing game development all my life, and they'll say, oh, what kind of things? And I can say, I can say like we did the first ever Xbox game, Fusion Frenzy. It beat Halo, and they go, oh, nice. Or I'll talk about doing Bad Boys or this other game or this one. And then I say, oh, when we did the Burger King games, and, that, and that's when I go, oh, you did the Burger King games, and it's far more higher profile than anything else I've done, which is just that is strange. Um. I kind of look back on it a lot more fondly now. It was a bit kind of cringe to start with as to, oh, this is my legacy, is this going to be the one? That's, that's pretty crazy. Um, now I've got kids and they think it's quite cool in a weird way. And they love the fact that the, um, I can't remember his name, the pro wrestler that's trying to buy every single copy of Sneak King. Have you seen him? Yeah, I find that on Reddit and on Twitter and any other social media. Anytime someone shows off their collection where they have way too many copies of one game, people are like, uh-oh, someone's gunning for the Sneak King guy, and I get tagged in it all the time, and I think it's so funny that out of all the dumb things that I've done in my life and all the weird times I've been on TV, in my underwear, head button, thumbtacks, or whatever, the thing that I get called out for the most is having just way too many copies of the game Sneak King. And if that's how I'm remembered, if I ever die in this world, uh, I think that's a valid, uh, noble thing to be remembered for. Just the fact that I made someone laugh once is enough for me. It, it justifies storing all this and all that. If I could get a good laugh, get a couple of points on Reddit, it doesn't matter. It's about the story. It's about the laughter. It's about the humor. And that's what life is about. It's not about becoming super successful or famous. It's about finding things that make you laugh and, and rushing toward them and holding onto them dearly uh, because we have so little time on this world. And if you're not doing stuff that produces laughter for yourself and others, then what are you, what are you doing?